Can't wait to get your next console, part two. Setting aside my thoughts for a comparison of the Xbox One and PS4 for the next episode, in this 19th episode of Gaming Wars, let's go over the Xbox One. The good, the bad, and the ugly. But first, if you're wondering what are my favorite shopping products, I've linked some Amazon shopping lists that I'll be continuously updating in the links below. We now return you to regular programming. After all the great feedback from the PS4 Primer video, I wanted to dig into what we know about the Xbox One in the same way. While it's popular now to bash on the Xbox One, it's important to remember we all have unique use cases. What appeals to you will be different than what appeals to others. The goal of platform owners like Microsoft, Sony, and Valve is to get as many people as possible onto their platforms by appealing to the common usage scenarios. So with that in mind, why should you buy the Xbox One? First, the Xbox One had a rocky start among developers and disappointed many core gamers. A lot of the blame falls on this former Microsoft executive. Fortunately, we have a product for people who aren't able to get some form of connectivity. It's called Xbox 360. But it's important to remember that he turned billion dollar Red Ring of Death losses into billion dollar Xbox Live profits while launching the most successful gaming peripheral in console history. But his winning streak ended spectacularly when he stumbled, fumbled, and ultimately left Microsoft to work for another company. But before he left, in a post titled, Your Feedback Matters, he cleaned up his messes. An internet connection will not be required to play offline Xbox One games. Trade in, lend, resell, gift, and rent disc-based games just like you do today. There will be no regional restrictions, and we will give consumers the choice of both physical and digital content. So now with that out of the way, let's talk about performance. The only hardware change since E3 was a clock speed boost. But as developer deadlines got closer, Microsoft has been feverishly trying to differentiate from Sony through software. Developers complained, honestly, the hardest thing to deal with is not the architecture, it's the OS, all the SDKs. That's the stuff that changes. It becomes a massive change internally for our entire engine. Another said, we have to do very specific things with memory allocation and drivers to get our stuff running. It made our teams quite a bit larger. The updates we had to make to our engine have been the large developer obstacles. But the late software releases seem to affect developers that were tweaking existing game engines. For example, Forza 5's new engine is optimized specifically for the Xbox One. That's how Turn 10 Studios hit 1080p at 60 frames per second. The moment you make something that is custom, you have more control. Every game developer has to manage these trade-offs to create a great gaming experience. At launch, the Xbox One sacrifices the raw graphical performance core gamers and developers like to brag about to make room for a more inclusive media experience. This blue ocean counterintuitive strategy actually has a history of success. The Wii focused on a more easy to learn input control for casual gamers. And the PlayStation 2 succeeded with the first to market DVD functionality for the masses. But we'll get more into that later. For now, let's go over the included accessories. A big part of the platform and user experience is built around the new and improved Kinect sensor. With a wider field of view and 1080p resolution, the Kinect can measure facial expression, 25 different joints, shifting body weight, place 1080p Skype calls, and even estimate heart rate. And the bandwidth is wide enough to track up to six people at once. If you're worried about privacy, the console doesn't need the Kinect to work anymore. The MonoChat headset has inline audio controls that you can access from the controller. Now let's talk controllers. The newly designed D-pad has a new type of switch providing more crisp feedback. The impulse triggers on the back have rumble motors that bring directional haptic feedback to the tip of your trigger finger, the most sensitive part of your hand. For example, if you run out of bullets, you could now feel the empty chamber. Also, the magnetic trigger sensor is twice as sensitive as before. Thumbsticks are smaller and closer to the center, and with added ridge texture to improve grip and the decreased dead zone in the center boosts accuracy and precision. By moving the battery inside the controller, the grip is better, allowing the thumb to more efficiently access the controls. The optional play and charge kit includes a rechargeable pack and charging cable with an LED status indicator. After setup, the controllers can automatically pair to the console through infrared LEDs detected by the Kinect. If the controller is passed to a friend, the Kinect detects the new person holding the controller. Meanwhile, PC gamers hoping to use this controller will have to wait until next year. The HDMI cable can feed different types of displays. And probably traumatized after the Xbox 360's Red Ring of Death, the Xbox One has an external power supply which should keep the heat, fans, and overall noise level down. And although it supports Wi-Fi, 
Using Ethernet reduces the strain from mobile devices using your Wi-Fi network. On the console itself, we have the power switch, slot loading optical disk drive, a USB port that supports an external drive, a binding button to set up your controller, and the back ports include an optical audio port for home theaters, and two more USB ports among other things. And it's always important to keep the hardware well ventilated. After you power up the Xbox One, before you can do anything, you need to install the day one update. After, you might want to play some of these first-party launch games. And these third-party games will also be available. It's worth noting that Microsoft has been outspending Sony to get developers to make exclusive Xbox One titles or offer exclusive content. But besides investing in games, Microsoft has always wanted the Xbox to do more than just play video games. The all-in-one user interface and Windows kernel is where the Xbox sets itself apart from the console industry. As if we walked in the room, Mark is automatically recognized, and then I'm recognized, and we're presented with our own custom uh, home screen. After all, building servers and software has always been Microsoft's key competitive advantage. As I said earlier, most of the user experience is centered around the Kinect. For example, signing in on any Xbox is completely automatic, whether it's your own console or a friend's console. Xbox, show my stuff. Front and center is the most recent activity, the pins on the left are for your custom apps and content, and the Microsoft Store is to the right. The Connect process is voice commands. Xbox, go to Forza Motorsport 5. And Suspend and Resume will be ready to use at launch. The operating system is split, one for gaming and the other for apps. And thanks to a hypervisor managing the states of both operating systems, you can quickly switch applications. Xbox, go to Internet Explorer. Now I'm in Internet Explorer. Xbox, watch TV. I'm back in some TV I was watching. Xbox, go to Forza Motorsport 5. But the thing that makes the Xbox One experience unique is how it subsumes all media and software into one interface. No matter what you're doing on the console, the hypervisor allows you to get invites to games and Skype calls. The software and sensors improve video calls by intelligently framing the people in the room. The built-in game DVR allows you to say things like, Xbox, record that, to save the last few seconds of gameplay, edit the clip before sending it to the upload studio. Lastly, Microsoft is tackling TV discovery through something called the One Guide. You can navigate with your voice, Xbox Select, what's on HBO, create a favorites list, and add app channels. Now let's talk media. At its core, the Xbox One is an HDMI pass-through device that integrates whatever content you connect into the UI. The Kinect has a built-in IR blaster array that could potentially control your entire home theater setup. And even though I don't have a lot of time to watch American football, NFL on Xbox One demonstrates how Microsoft hopes other developers will integrate software and network services into the live TV experience. My favorite feature? The console is DLNA compatible, so it can stream media from other computers to the TV. And of course, Microsoft is expanding its network infrastructure. For free, the Xbox One will allow you to do voice chat, get unlimited friends, and support games that will work with the Smart Glass app on your mobile device. But a lot of the functionality is behind the Xbox Live Gold membership, sold separately. It offers in-game voice chat and something called Smart Match, where you can play a game while the next match is being set up in the background. Each match is set up according to skill, language, and reputation to make the gaming experience a lot smoother. Anyone in the house can enjoy the benefits of Xbox Live Gold, including multiplayer, even when the person is not logged on. Xbox Fitness offers instant feedback from these trainers for free until 2015 with your Xbox Live Gold membership. The Xbox One also experiments more deeply with cloud computing. By learning how the gamer and the community behave, gaming worlds have the potential to evolve over time. As an example, Forza 5 creates avatars that are based on the driving behaviors of the gamer. As the gamer advances, the avatar updates. Then these so-called drivatars can race when the gamer is away. But before you unbox your Xbox One, we need to cover some of the downsides. There's no backwards compatibility, and some of the media and recording features do require an Xbox Live Gold membership. And then there's the infamous benchmarks. As I said earlier, developers found themselves sacrificing resolution to include more AI, keep the frame rates high, or include Kinect functionality. 
For example, although Battlefield 4 natively renders about half the pixel count of the PS4, the Kinect can mirror your head movements in the game or respond to voice commands. Call of Duty Ghost renders at 720p natively before upscaling. Because Microsoft reserves about 10% of the GPU to the operating system, precious resources are inaccessible to game developers. Mark Rubin said, One of the greatest challenges is memory management, or thread management. You can't just take a megabyte from anywhere. You have to pull it from something else. The resource allocation is different on the consoles. So what happened? Late Xbox One software revisions caused a ton of headaches. The SDK is changing all the time, but it's changing less quickly on the PS4 than it was six months ago. Also, developers have to target a different hardware architecture. Remember, the Xbox One has two memory pools for render targets. When a launch date for a video game approaches, some publishers choose to lower the resolution of the render targets to hit a deadline. On the other hand, other publishers decided to postpone their launch dates. Does this make the Xbox One a fail? Not necessarily. Remember, Microsoft is trying to reach beyond the gamer market by offering fantasy football, fitness, Skype, and the all-in-one user interface. As covered in previous Gaming Wars episodes, Microsoft definitely overreached and has since backpedaled. But the core vision to extend the console beyond gaming can be a valuable proposition if it's marketed correctly in the future. In a couple of weeks, the Xbox One will have a wide global launch. The console is really a logical extension of the vision Microsoft painted at the announcement, a machine with a camera designed to take over the living room. If you'd like to support the channel and order your next console or video game, check the Amazon links below to make sure you're getting the best deal. Now's the time where I personally thank all the most recent subscribers. Welcome to the channel, a place where I hope we can share ideas and opinions about innovative things that might one day qualify to be our own personal digital appliances. I always read every single comment, and thanks in advance for liking and sharing these videos on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, and Reddit. Each episode takes a lot of work and research, but your comments here on YouTube, and also from the game subreddit, keep me honest, and help me plan out future episodes. So I thank you all. If you really liked this video, click the squares from your computer, or check the links below to watch related episodes. Now I'm going to get back to work on the next episode, which will be a showdown between the Xbox One and PlayStation 4. So please stay tuned, here on...